had to assume a disguise since the book has been published. And in fact, it's in my possession temporarily. There's uh, David getting a ringy dingy. One ringy dingy, two ringy dingies. Hello, Evans. Hello, your affluence. Guess what I have? Uh, a cookie. No, a book. Ah, okay. Tell us about it. Well, better than tell, I can show everybody. I'm showing them the envelope now. It's marked extremely urgent, and the book came out even better than I had hoped. And here's a copy of the book. This is, I, it was supposed to be a proof, but it's not a proof. It's the correct book. So <coughs> this, <coughs> this is book number one out of 126. And this book is going to England tomorrow night, and it'll be signed by any able danger person that happens to be lurking around Bletchley Park, which would involve... I believe four or five able danger named agents and uh, Ian Crane who's the host of the conference will probably sign it too I hope so and we're gonna make it book number one and then the book will be presented to uh, Colonel James Sabow's brother Dr. David Sabow so he'll get book number one um, but over to you David while I try to join people in the chat room well, thank you, Phil, and I'm sure that that's going to make a major impact on uh, uh, Colonel Sabo's brother. And um, I think we've got some really intriguing uh, elements of ammunition and azimuth for you to go to the UK with in respect to the Obama 8A hotspot bombs. Now, this is kind of intriguing because the original hotspot the hot shot, hot spot bomb was invented by a guy called Jack Lewis in World War II. And it was designed so paratroopers could go into North Africa. And although uh, they weren't generally dropped after from aircraft after the fiasco of the first uh, mission of the long range uh, desert group, they were moved in by uh, ground transport. The same logic applies. They needed a light bomb that would wreak havoc on a German aircraft or an Italian aircraft in the North Africa campaign. And this guy, Jock Lewis, came up with something really simple. I wonder why people hadn't thought of it before, but that's usually the way with a new idea. That's uh, about a pound of uh, high explosive and a uh, quarter pound of thermite. And you stick it on the under wing of an aircraft, and it has very interesting combinatorial properties. One is the explosive obviously blows a big chunk of damage into the aircraft, but the incendiary is very interesting because you can ignite the fuel tanks and basically remove evidence of the attack because the thermite uh, part of the incendiary uh, burns at a temperature or has a reaction temperature of about 5,800 degrees Fahrenheit. And you know what that does feel, over to you. Well, 5,800 degrees Fahrenheit, if I'm not mistaken, I rarely am. I just said that to be humorous. Uh -huh. uh, it's half the temperature of the sun on the surface of the sun. Uh, yes, you're absolutely right. And the boiling point or melting point of steel is about uh, 2,800 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you get hit by a piece of thermite reacting, um, you're going to be vaporized and turned into plasma. So... You know, you'll have ions and electrons and protons and neutrons floating around, which will be transparent, and, but there'll be very little evidence left. Of course, as you get further away from the center or reaction temperature, as you say, it's about the temperature, half the temperature of the surface of the sun, instead of vaporizing, you get some very characteristic debris. And it appears that the characteristic debris yet to be found in the forest fires southwest of uh, Port, uh, Fort, um, Fort McMurray is the same kind of debris or will be the same kind of debris as found at Ground Zero where there were hot spots burning uh, five or six days after the attack of 911 underground and generating molten steel. 
And I think we both have a good explanation for that, don't we, Phil? Over to you. I wasn't listening. Honestly, I'm trying to catch up in the chat room because I got a hold of you first and I just showed up in the chat room. So summarize your question. I'll give you a 40-minute run-on answer. Yeah, I think we know why there's molten steel in the debris pile of the World, w, trade, the World trade Centers, right? I still don't understand your question. You, what, we understand why there's molten steel in the debris pile of the World Trade Center, right? I don't think there is any molten steel anymore. It's been 14 years. Okay, when the when the building had collapsed. Yeah, it's because it was so hot. It was uh, ignited by something other than jet fuel, which if jet fuel is uh, burning efficiently, it might produce 1,200 degrees. But we know from the black smoke on 9-11, it was not burning efficiently, so it was probably around 900 degrees. And that wouldn't uh, leave hot spots days later. Is that the answer you seek? Yeah, absolutely. So I decided I would have a look, if I could find it, and in today's post, uh, I've sent the link, uh, how the forest fires out of Fort McMurray progressed, where they started, and what evidence has been to give to the public to prove that it was not an act of arson. And I've discovered day one, and there's a link in the post, uh, and I'll send it into the chat room in a minute. Maybe someone could find it. Day one, there was a interesting contour to the forest fire as seen by overhead satellites at Fort McMurray, which is it wasn't a point, it was actually a bar about the width of Fort McMurray, Greater Fort McMurray, that was in the southwest quadrant of Fort McMurray when the prevailing winds were blowing northeast. So on day one, there wasn't a point source. There was actually a bar that requires accelerants to be placed in the axis uh, north, um, northwest to southeast so that the fire can be blown toward Fort McMurray. And really to do that, you have to have, rather than guys running through the forest with accelerants, you have to have them pre-positioned and wait for a convenient wind to blow the fire towards Fort McMurray and have, I think they've got to evacuate 80,000 people from Fort McMurray, which to a certain extent is a ghost town. Not all the infrastructure has been burned, but it's the kind of damage that we really saw at ground zero. Now, I think, Phil, by the time you arrive in the United Kingdom, we'll be able to demonstrate that the people who designed the hotspot bombs that triggered the fire in Fort McMurray are the same people who designed the hotspot bombs which brought down Towers 1, 2, and 7 in New York. And that's going to be interesting because if we dig a little deeper into the history of hotspot bombs, we come back to World War II and Jack Lewis. Jack Lewis was killed, I think. He was uh, hit by a bullet from a Messerschmitt in North Africa. He's sometimes considered as the founder of the SAS or co-founder of the Long Range 8 Desert Group. But he had this amazing bomb where they could hit an airfield and in a carefully coordinated manner with a couple of vehicles, they could attach, and I think they did, the Lewis bomb on the underwing of the German or Italian aircraft, and they destroyed, I think, about 40 aircraft in one little mission. How's that for efficiency? Over to you. I think it's very efficient. That's why I've always said that if I were in charge on 9-11, I'd issue a command, launch the world, meaning everything that's capable of getting airborne, safe or not, uh, mission capable or not, totally refueled or not, armed or not, Everything capable of moving through the air under its own power should have been put in the air, uh, especially tankers, uh, meaning air refueling tankers, who could keep the uh, any jets that had uh, the full mission capability, uh, which is called Code 1 in the Air Force. Uh, by the way, this book, which is the first book in a series of 27, David, did you think I just misspoke when I said the first book in a series of 27? 
Well, I think you upped the ante. Yes, because it's the first book in a series of 13. And if people think that I've written them, the people are simply wrong. I'm going to turn to a random page, and I hope I don't shoot myself in the foot. But the 284 pages of this book were written by the perpetrators, not by me, Field McConnell. And this paragraph I turned to randomly on page 178. That's powerful. Where I flew F-4s and F-16s was the 178th Fighter Squadron. Can't make this up. Okay, I'm, I'm starting right below the picture of Bitter Harvest, which was when they killed uh, Gordon. What was Gordon's last name? Gordon Call, K-A-H-L. Uh, they killed him because he was a tax protester. And today I just uh, posted something under the Anavon Rights picture that tells you about how to stop paying tax legally. And it's, I'm not advising people to do that. I'm just telling people I did it, and it works. Uh, having said that, I'm going to just read a little bit. We'll see, I'm going to stop when I get to a fact, David. Chips, please explain to Dice and Notso how you happen to know this information that, that, that did not appear in the book Bitter Harvest, which was the erudite volume written concerning the FBI killing of a World War II Christian veteran that had rightfully objected to paying the IRS. Well, that is a fact, and I didn't set that up, and I didn't set up page 178. In fact, to prove it, uh, I'm going to flip through the book, not knowing what page I'm on, until somebody says stop. And when somebody says stop, I will read. Uh, I'll start at the upper left-hand corner, and I will read until I come to a fact that was not written by me. In other words, I, I'm the fiction writer, and I will... Uh, that face you make when you trade your soul for power. Yeah, they're a bunch of ghouls. Okay. Tw Ginger says it's 22. Thank you, Ginger. Uh, the prayer today is, uh, I've got two prayers. One for the bad people, which is Mark 836, I believe. And one for everyone else. So, let me see if Cause we've got time in the ticky 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 time in cry yeah 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 Mark eight thirty six. Let's see if I'm right. First of all, if I'm not right, I'll admit it. Mark eight thirty six. Hmm. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world yet forfeit his soul? That's why I put up the very, very gruesome pictures of Bill Clinton, Prince Fartingham, and G.H.W. Bush, because you guys uh, have forfeited your souls, I believe. And I can be proven wrong if you get on your knees and beg forgiveness uh, of God himself. And he is merciful and mighty, and he will forgive you. But uh, all of us, me included, we need to ask for forgiveness, not assume that it's going to happen. Uh, the next psalm, David, do you know what day yesterday was in the United States of America? I think it was Mother's Day, right? Yes, and my mother, who died, or although she's alive now, isn't she? She uh, passed away from this earthly trap uh, on a day in September, and it's coming to me right about now the 5th of September of 2008. This was her favorite passage. And this passage uh, is going to do me well on my trip to England. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. 
I see a handwritten note from one of my daughters that she memorized that in the sixth grade. Uh, the fruit doesn't fall far from the tree. I want to just read one thing, David. You heard it in passing, but it didn't click. Uh, not only with you, it didn't click with anyone else either. It's uh, Psalm 23, 5. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. David, do you know where I'm speaking uh, this weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday? And do you know what is headquartered in that town? Over to you briefly. Uh, Bletchley Park Museum? Yes, Bletchley Park, which was the World War II headquarters of GCHQ or their forerunners, and now it's the headquarters for MI6. But let's take 90 seconds for Colonel Sabo, and uh, I hope that Dr. Sabo and uh, the son and the daughter and the widow of Colonel James Edward Sabo, United States Marine Corps, I hope they are not offended by my humbly, humble offering. Uh, I did the best I could for you guys, and I'm not quitting. I've got uh, 22 or 23 more, excuse me, 27 minus one. I've got 26 more books uh, already assembled, and somebody might say, how can you assemble books so fast? Just have to watch history. If perpetrators are doing this stuff. I'm just picking colors, which reminds me, the first person to pick a page number uh, at, during the 90 seconds, whatever page number is up there first, and it has to be in this format, P-A-G-E, number sign, and then the number. Uh, I will read that <clears throat> when the 90 seconds is over. 90 seconds of silence, please. <clears throat> There's 90 seconds, and uh, David, uh, I'll turn it over to you in a minute, but I want to just punctuate what I've said about what profit it a man if he gains the world but forfeits his soul, and I want to go, it's just because it's Mother's Day, and I want to honor all mothers, not just my own, and uh, I don't want to honor people that have uh, even though they're mothers, they have tried to destroy my country, and uh, that's dangerous because you never know who's going to defend my country. Uh, and in honor of my mother, this was her second favorite in the Bible. It's called More Than Conquerors. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called, and those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Uh, what then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all of us, how will he not also along with him graciously give up all things? 
Who will bring any charge against thee who God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is that that condemns? Christ Jesus who died, more than that who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, we will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. David, it's a big day for me. This book, um, and this book number one, will be signed by uh, named agents in Bluckley Park. And uh, I believe, and I'm not sure, but I never do anything on my own authority, as you guys know. I'm seeking guidance you know, from people that know about books. Um, but I think the place for me to sign might be right next to my name on this page. And then the other people, and the other people I anticipate that may be there to sign the book. Uh, and I'll give agent names, not uh, given names. Agent Dice, Agent Afterburner, Agent Reef Boy. Uh, Ian R. Crane may be there. And we have another male label danger person that may or may not be there. And now I'm going to uh, turn it over to you, David. And Jack Max says page number something. Uh, we got a page 49. Let's see who did it first. Okay. Uh, Silas has gone to the car. Uh, oh, yeah. I love that picture, Bucky. Uh, it's got to be 66 and 7. Okay, 29, 49. Uh, I think, uh-oh, page number, I think I'm correct in saying that the first person who put it up correctly was George H., and he put up page number 66. But I'm going to, before I read page number 66 from the upper left-hand corner, I'm going to read, um, the words of Susan Darby of Maine. When the powerful set themselves high in order to look down upon those whom they hope to gain advantage over, there is very little moral restraint to the use of expedient foul play whenever an opportunity is recognized. It's way past time for sunshine to expose evil, forcing it to flee from the scene. Few venture as far as Field McConnell into the depths of the systems that make the world work. What he has found doing his work along with David Hawkins and the Able Danger team is a remarkable list of hein heinous, acrid, and foul deeds, some of which have been kept hidden for centuries yet continue to influence the modern world. No matter how deep he goes using his life experiences and the wits of a fighter pilot, his fellow researchers go along with him to learn and to collaborate. Uh, as more and more facts are gathered, the grave necessity of continued dredging becomes apparent. Hang on to your hats, fellow travelers. We are going into turbulence. Tragedies are felt most strongly when a man dies before his time, either from an accident or an illness beyond cure. When the life of a man who dies before his time at the hands of those in positions of a power and respect, that is a crime which must be fully investigated no matter where the facts may lead and the perp perpetrators prosecuted, no matter who they are. And having said that, I want to, I'd like to read the whole book. In fact, I wrote the whole book. I, I just wrote the fiction. The perpetrators wrote the facts. But before I sign off, would somebody remind me to read the acknowledgments, please? Uh, also, even though nobody in the chat room may recognize the name James Phillips from Arizona, I, I may read that if uh, Bucky Badger or any other named agent uh, reminds me to do it. But I think that George Holdsworth said 66, upper left-hand corner, and the verbal contract was I would stop us, and there I am on the up. hope Dr. Sabo doesn't mind me wearing his book out. Page 66, upper left-hand corner, I'm going to stop when I get to the first fact.
Agent Chips helped secure Dice's torso harness to the upper cliff and then gave Notso one tug. Notso crank, cranked Dice up three feet so that at exactly 1859, Chips could be secure his torso. Oh, Chips could secure his torso harness before giving Natsu a thumbs up as he held both duffels in his right hand. Natsu engaged the electric motor to lift his co-agents to the roof as the Puma AS332 stood off the south side of the Metropole. Chips thought of the 1982 monster hit by Alan Parsons Project and have wondered if someday they would play an outdoor concert with a Eurocopter making a cameo appearance. Well, that did in fact happen. The name of the song was I am the eye in the sky, looking at you, I can cheat you blind. I am the maker of rules, dealing with fools. Anyway, that's a wonderful song, that's a fact. Um, this book is written in facts. It's also got a lot of fiction to make the facts uh, palatable. Nothing's palatable about George H.W. Bush making $1 trillion on 9-11 or George H.W. Bush working with a bunch of guys that I listed in today's radio show ad, killing JFK so they could keep the oil revenues up in Texas. And as long as we're in a G.H.W. Bush uh, thread, it's nothing cute about his sticking it up uh, Saddam's rear end after... Um, G.H.W. Bush got Saddam Hussein to go into Kuwait so that G.H.W. Bush could have British and American people light the Kuwaiti oil fires. Uh, you heard me correctly. The U.S. and British people lit those fires, not the uh, retreating Iraqis. And uh, G.H.W. Bush made $200 billion, I believe, uh, in that first war. He made $1 trillion on 9-11. Uh, I'm not afraid of these rich and powerful people because I've got my Lord and Savior. David, over to you. Thank you, Phil. So, in the chat room, we've got a couple of links. One to the movement of the hotspots through Fort McMurray earlier this month. And another one... A thermal image taken from above uh, ground zero in the days succeeding 911. And from a forensic analysis point of view, there's something very interesting missing from that data. Because the satellites overhead would have actually had real time continuous images prior to the attacks in both places. And they haven't released that to the public. When they do, and they will, because Able Danger will make them do it, we'll find out that there was a hot spot, a localized hot spot, southwest of Fort McMurray, that then triggered a band running from the northeast to the southwest about the width of the diameter of greater Fort McMurray. And when the ignition of the hot spot bomb took place, that would have triggered the incendiaries or accelerants placed in that northwest southeast band. And the band of very hot fire or incendiary devices would have moved northeast towards Fort McMurray. And you can see, um, I'm looking at the images that's dated. May the 2nd, and it's a step function, so it goes May the 2nd to May the 8th, which was yesterday. You can see how brilliantly they designed it to sweep through Fort McMurray and causes, caused probably the biggest peacetime evacuation of a city in Canada ever. I think 88,000 people fled this. Many of those people actually lost everything. Their homes have gone. They're now embedded in the community around it. There's a great deal of hospitality and courage and generosity, and you'd expect that of actually any country anywhere. But they haven't released the information that would allow the public at large to make a forensic analysis of who started that fire and how it started. Similar overhead uh, 
remote sensing images would have been available to the satellites. Oh, let me just ask you a question, Field. I know you know the answer. Which company is the biggest satellite signal processor in the world? Over to you. I don't know the answer, but a lot of the answers I don't know uh, can be uh, answered by saying Circo. Well, that's actually McDonald Detmeyer Associates of Richmond, British Columbia. That's what I meant to say. When I said Circo, that was Able Danger Code for Mike MDA. <laughs> of, uh, in fact, our whole story started in uh, Vancouver, British Columbia, did they not? Where I was on an airline layover, and I yes. went over to play three songs on the jukebox. Do you remember what those three songs were? Uh, the Last Scream of the Missing Women. No, you always remember your own stuff and you forget my stuff. The three songs that I played were F4, C6, and D8. F4 because, well, I'll just show you why the F4. There's why F4 right there. C6 is a Ford transmission and D8's a Caterpillar crawler tractor. Over to you, David. You know what? It's just fantastic. You look back at that first chapter of the first book and the image there, or maybe that's the second chapter, is an image of the sweep undertaken by the satellites for which McDonald Detweiler is processing the signals. And in that first chapter, and maybe in that uh, in the entry, you know, the italicized entry we used to do. Yeah. I think we concluded that the prime scene profile that pointed to the same signature of the debris dump at the pig farm is similar in content and purpose to the Fresh Kills landfill at um, Staten Island. Is that is my memory playing me tricks or isn't that what we had? Over to you. Memories sweeten through the ages just like time. Uh, no, your memory is correct. Do you remember the which Fresh Kills land hills those were? Uh, one and seven. Sure, it wasn't one and nine? You're right. I just was testing you. Oh, good. I passed. Over to you. <laughs> so if we'd had a satellite image, well, we, we will. No, correction. They have satellite images of the entire process from the beginning of the fire, which ultimately would consume a large chunk of Fort McMurray and drive 88,000 Canadians from their homes and burn a whole bunch of them. And they have real-time continuous images from satellites above uh, ground zero that if they were in the hands of the public, they would never have been able to sustain this myth that the Earth is targeted by catastrophic anthropogenic global warming and these vermin are the ambassadors or disciples to stop the Earth being consumed by catastrophic anthropogenic global warming and those people are scientifically and technically illiterate. And actually, if any deaths have resulted from their activities, they should be looking at the electric chair or the gallows on Old Gallows Road, right? Yes, the Old Gallows Road. That's where NSAWW, Courtney Brown, Lynn Sherlock, uh, I said Courtney Brown, it's Courtney Banks, Deb Brown, Lynn Sherlock, Christine Marcy, and another uh, rabid female uh, named J.M. Cohen. Uh, J.M. Cohen, rabid female, was once number two under Janet Napolitano at DHS, and I sent him much information in the time frame 2007 to 2008, and uh, that dweeb never responded. I charge him with treason. David, over to you. Yeah, there's going to be a lot more you know, on death row, I think, when this is finished. But um, so I just flip over and I put in again the hotspots at Ground Zero uh, in the chat room. And you can see there's a nice little cluster where Building 7 used to be and then Towers 1 and 2. But from a, uh, a anisotropic, which is a measure of the disorder point of view, you can see that the signature of the hotspot bombs that brought down Building Number 7 is the same signature in terms of scatter and temperature as the hotspot bombs which brought down one and two. The only problem from the conspirators' point of view is no plane 
hit building number seven. But it came down for the same scientific and technically consistent reasons. So they installed hotspot bombs. Now, where did they install them? Well, it's fairly obvious, the logical place to install them, because remember, the logic of having the Lewis bomb was that it was compact, highly effective in terms of being able to combine high explosive and extremely hot temperatures from the thermite, and very portable. Now, if they had brought truckloads of explosives into Towers 1 and 2 and 7, even the brain-dead security people that were uh, delegated to look after those buildings and the tenants inside them might have noticed. Not obviously noticed, because after all, presumably the same brain-dead people who secured the Twin Towers uh, during 1993 attack, they didn't notice the rider truck coming in. And I think there was a rider truck, wasn't the wasn't the field <coughs> at the Oklahoma City bombing? Is that correct? Yes, and it had fertilizer and it had a couple of veterans, one named Terry somebody, maybe Terry McNichol, I can't remember. We have our own McNichol here, Agent McDime is actually Agent McNichol. And then Timothy Vey, uh, which I think he was named after the Jewish lament, Oy Vey. Uh, my sister, of course, burned down the uh, Murrah building, did the Branch Davidians, and my sister, Christine Marcy, uh, even though she was offered the opportunity to write the foreword to my book, she declined. Over to you, David. Yeah, and she also had Timothy McVeigh executed in 2001, so he wouldn't reveal the true perpetrators behind the Murrah building bomb, right? Yeah, I guess my sister's not a nice person. No, I guess she's not, uh, but of course... Uh, in the greater scheme of things, she's an expendable because the powers behind your sister are much more powerful than your sister, of course. But that business of expendable applies totally to what the RCMP called a virtual floating matrix. And Hitler is an expendable. Trump is an expendable. George Bush Sr. and Jr., they are expendable because the matrix works with a brilliantly simple formula developed probably hundreds of years ago, but certainly refined in World War II by the Special Operations Executive. So I'm going back to the origins of the Lewis bomb and how it was deployed so effectively. And what happened in 1954 is very important because in 1954, the Bilderberg Group was formed and introduced to the use and the deployment of the Lewis bomb in its modern form, which is basically a bomb that can be detonated and ignited through very precise timing signals for what is known as a variable yield or a dial yield. That is to say, if you ignite the incendiaries first and there's a big gap before any attempt to detonate the explosives, all of the explosives are consumed by the heat of the incendiary. If, however, you detonate the explosives first, they're going to blow all the incendiary elements of the bomb to smithereens, and you don't have the concentrated mass to get the high temperature. So if you can generate an extremely precise signal or correction, a, an extremely precise period between the detonation of the explosives and the ignition of the incendiaries, you can actually dial any effect you want from a percussion explosives with very little damage or burning to an incendiary device with very little percussive energy entering the body of the victim. And I actually, I nearly got fired from Schlumberger because on Barrow Island, I thought I'd save myself some work and money by putting a shaped charge with some sandbags pointing downwards on a cement where I wanted to create a hole to put a, a pole in. And... Um, I detonated the explosive, which if I'd been working, if they knew that now, well, I, would not, well, I wouldn't have continued my brilliant career with Schlumberger. But anyway, it made a very impressive bang and brought a lot of the workers from around that particular area rushing to the scene and asking me what the hell, well, they had very colorful Australianisms to ask me what the hell I was doing. And um, do you know, Field, I think for the first time in my life, I lied but I can't remember what the lie was, but generally it doesn't pay to lie, right? Over to you. Uh, it's a lot easier to tell the truth. Uh, 
it and that's uh, brings us to two things. Number one is when I speak uh, at I think it's I'm speaking at 3 p.m. on Sunday, the 15th of May of this coming weekend. And I don't have to think. I don't have to have notes. I don't have to uh, lie. All I have to do is regurgitate the truth at a cyclic rate. And uh, I will do that. And I will be saying that G.H.W. Bush and Hillary Clinton are two of the kingpins that need to be taken down for the welfare of the global community. Uh, and I will speak these words without fear or favor. Uh, what do I have to be afraid of? If you guys didn't hear what I read out of Psalm 90, uh, excuse me, Psalm 96, 14 is what I was thinking of. That's the call, but no, Psalm 23. Uh, there's no reason to be afraid of these people. I mean, uh, all they've done really is they've implicated themselves. And uh, I had mentioned that I might read something from James Phillips, a name that does not ring the bell of most of you. Uh, so I'll do that right now, and I'll try to read quickly. Field McConnell presents an astounding and eyebrow-raising alternative history of the events that occurred during the September 11, 2001 bombing of the World Trade Twin Towers. As an expert pilot who has flown hundreds of military jets and commercial aircraft, he postulates that no human being could have flown a normal commercial aircraft into those towers. McConnell explains how Boeing Corporation has been flying drone versions of their commercial airliners since the 1950s and how these planes must have been flown uh, remote controlled into the towers. McConnell's theory is well supported by the data and uh, answers many of the technical questions that his expert testimony gives to the conspiracy theorists around the world, signed James Phillips of Arizona. Uh, another thing that I'll probably say when I'm over speaking at Bleckley Park is uh, I'll probably say that Hillary Clinton is directly related to the false flag attack of 9-11 and that she worked closely with uh, six Canadian men and my sister, Christine Marcy. David, over to you. Absolutely right, Field. And so one thing we can do, and we're doing many things on multiple fronts, that is going to cause some serious sphincter snapping amongst what I believe David Rockefeller would describe as the inevitable move towards a supranational government of world bankers and an intellectual elite. And let me just, because I know that you have a tremendous knowledge of human anatomy field, do you think the intellectual elite uh, might engage in some impromptu sphincter snapping when they see you in full flagrante? Over to you. I'm not sure what full flagrante means, but I hope it's not a Spanish word for flatulence. What does that word mean? Well, if you're caught in flagrante, it's in a sexual relationship that some people don't believe you should be having. Oh, well, uh, isn't that sort of up to the participants? I suppose so. Yeah, I think it's illegal when one participates against their will. Otherwise, I think it's party on, Garth, uh, but it's always safer to be operating within the context of a committed relationship or a sacred marriage. And um, in fact, it's sort of interesting. I have a piece of paper here that I'm going to read now. And if I can find it, if I can't find it, I'm not going to read it, but uh, I think I'll find it. Oh, my book, Jesus Calling, the lady who sent me that, uh, she called me the other day, and I thanked her for this book. She gave you a copy also, David, and I thanked her oh, for you. Thank you. Yeah, here's uh, something I want to read. This goes back to uh, not only marriages, but also the IRS and the state of Wisconsin, who apparently doesn't find much humor in my communications. Uh, that's quite all right. Waiver. From the beginning, with God as my witness, I, Field, a true man of God, acknowledge all blessings given by God, repent all transgressions against God, and waive all contracts without God, Field, and a red thumbprint. Uh, this was d delivered to the state of Wisconsin and also to Pierce County, Wisconsin, both corporations, and uh, I think Pierce County uh, understands it. Uh, I know that the IRS understands it. I'm having a little difficulty with Wisconsin, but uh, David, uh, the difficulty I'm having with Wisconsin is no different than Trump, because Trump 
and Paul Ryan apparently don't see eye to eye, but um, Abel Danger participated in getting rid of Scott Walker off, and it's not because he's a Republican, it's not because he's Jewish, it's not because he's got some egregious balding, uh, it's because he works for the Koch brothers, he's bought and paid for, we don't need that kind of crap in Wisconsin. As far as uh, what's his name, Paul Ryan, uh, what can make him go away is by exposing his wife Jana's relationship to British bankers in the time period 2000 to 2002. Over to you, David. Yeah, and I think we uh, we may never know what impact we're having on these candidates as they drop away, but uh, about, I think, two or three weeks ago, we posted a hypothesis that uh, Heidi Cruz, the regional manager for Goldman Sachs in Houston, was uh, associated or involved in the attack on the Deepwater Horizon drilling platform. Uh, now, probably what we didn't know, but she would have known, or probably she would have known, is that there was a hotspot bomb <coughs> placed on the Deepwater Horizon rig underneath the heli deck. And they spoofed a command to the company I used to work for, which is uh, Schlumberger, uh, to take the what is known as the cement bond logging crew off the rig eight hours before it blew. Now, what is a cement bond log? Well, a cement bond log is a measurement by an acoustic device, which is lowered down the casing uh, that secures or prevents the hydrocarbons in the reservoir. It was a very good discovery well, uh, sliding up the side of the casing to the surface where they might uh, pool a very volatile mix of gases and hydrocarbons underneath the helideck, which acts like a cap, to be remotely detonated or ignited through a hotspot bomb. Uh, but the effect of the hotspot bomb is very interesting because maybe someone can pop it in the chat room. You'll see that the helideck has been burned in a with a rectangular hole, and just uh, after, I never know what that means actually, after to port or whatever, of the hole there is some um, paint which is undamaged, and that's a very characteristic of the fast flash fire from an incendiary device, depending on the fuel. The temperature goes up to half the temperature of the surface of the sun, so the particular uh, material in the vicinity, direct vicinity of that is vaporized, so it cuts a hole. But a little further than that, once the fuel is consumed, it reverts to um, ambient temperature. And so when I did my little uh, explosive uh, foolish hole making in a cement ramp on Barrow Island off Australia, um, I took the sandbags away. Hopefully that would have been enough. Well, it didn't. No one was injured. And it was a very focus-shaped charge pointing down. But the sandbag in the area immediately around the explosive was cool to the touch. Might sound paradoxical, but explosives are cool. And incendiaries are hot. And that's the essence of the conspiracy against the United States of America and the Five Eyes countries and their allies uh, since uh, World War II. So we should follow the late Major General Colin Gubbins, who went to the first Bilderberg in 1954 with a predatory pedophile by the name of Lord Boothby, who was closely involved with organized crime in London through the Cray Twins, and through the Cray Twins, the five organized crime families in New York. And of course, that's the cement that binds these scumbags Together is the pedophile trap, particularly in four-star and five-star hotels where those incumbents or occupants <coughs> of the presidential suite of the Sheraton Hotel in Chicago are supplied with underage children or minors for sexual abuse in their entertainment because the people who have invested or provided the loans to those hotels to come together know that um, entrapment, pedophile entrapment of these people, generally you can rely on their total obedience because if those individuals end up in a conventional jail with heterosexuals, they're going to lose some quite useful, 
well, depending on your point of view, useful parts of their anatomy. And that would be quite uh, sobering, I think, for Bill and Hillary Clinton, because in my opinion, they're both abusers of children. Um, my guess is that Hillary Clinton uh, pimped Monica Lewinsky for Bill and got compromising pictures of him um, in the Oval Office. But it's 12 o'clock field, and uh, so uh, we do an hour, right, um, on, uh, on Mondays and Thursdays. So how's it looking for you? Well, I got to answer a question. Go to the chat room, look underneath the uh, gay hearse, which, by the way, the hearse is outside right now. Um, in fact, I got, I sent a bunch of people pictures of this book on the hearse. I don't think anybody posted it yet. Um, some of you guys that I sent the picture to, maybe somebody could post the picture of this book on the hearse. Otherwise, I'll go do it in a minute. I want to read something from Agent 66. Um, Agent 66 says 140 people. I thought you said 40 people. You're right. Uh, we have an existing reservation for 40 people for Thursday night, uh, whatever day that is, the 13th of July, at Vino in the Valley for dinner. However, uh, if this book is ordered in sufficient quantities to indicate, and it's not a matter of money, it's a matter of interest, but if we get the indication, if we have an indication that we might be able to attract, say, 100 people to a book signing, there would be room for 140 people at Vino in the Valley. Vino in the Valley is willing to open early for us. Uh, if anybody goes to their website right now, vinointhevalley.com, and copy their hours of operation, you'll see that... Uh, on Saturdays, they typically open uh, either at 3 or 4 o'clock for dinner. Uh, they're willing to open up at 1 o'clock for a party of 140. Uh, and cooking for 140 people all at once is dicey. So I'm working with people, including Agent Dice, including, uh, well, including anyone who wants to offer me advice um, either in person this weekend at Bleckley Park or via email f-i-e-l-d-m-c-c -C at yahoo.com. I'm thinking if we have a book signing, uh, if we were to have say a hundred books pre-sold by a month before the signing, uh, so and the reason I say that is so we can be responsible to Vino in the Valley and give them a one month Notice that they can cancel the reservation. I think if we had a hundred books to sign, uh, we could have the entire restaurant. It's already been committed to us. It's an outdoor restaurant. It's wonderful. The ambiance is out of this world, especially if it's not raining. Ah, oh, there it is. Agent 66 just put up a picture of Vino in the Valley. Uh, Age Afterburner just put up a picture of the 36 Studebaker. My thought is. Rather than have a meal at 1 p.m., we could have hors d'oeuvres, we could have cheese and wine. Vino means wine. They got a lot of wine there. Uh, we could have wine and cheese, perhaps cheesecake, and maybe some fresh fruit like grapes, and maybe some bread with oil. Uh, people in Europe do that. They put some oil and vinegar maybe, but oil for sure. And then they take nice bread and they sop up the oil with it. So that's just an idea. And anyone uh, is cheese. Yes. In fact, Ginger, if you have time, would you go find Rybeki cheese? R-Y-B-I-C-K-I. Rybeki cheese. Rybeki cheese is the big cheese store in the Mall of America, which is the biggest uh, cheese, well, the Mall of America is the biggest mall in the United States, I believe. It was at one time. Uh, Rybeki Cheese, and I'll spell that. Up. I'm not sure I'm spelling it right, but R-Y-B-I-C-K-I -I Cheese. Uh, every Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, Dick Rybeki has his yellow and green uh, Green Bay Packers pickup truck by his cheese stand, and I haven't talked to him yet, but he's 80 years old. 
Um, Agent 66 says, that's an excellent idea, Field. I'm so looking forward to being a part of it. Okay, then you're officially raising your right hand and repeating after me. I, Agent 66, I, Agent Dice, solemnly swear to volunteer good ideas. So if we have a uh, book signing for as many as 140 people on Saturday, the 17th, no, 16th of July of 2016, all I need help with, ladies, uh, yeah, right, Becky. Um, the Vino in the Valley has all the wine you could ever want, and, and they have non-alcoholic wine, too, and they have non-alcoholic drinks. Um, Dick Rybicki has the big cheese store, and he has Gargonzola, by the way. That'll make sense to a couple of you that might know that I've recently acquired a taste for Gargonzola cheese, which is Italian, Italian blue cheese. So uh, if anybody wants to participate in the planning intellectually, uh, just email me, F-I-E-L-D-M-C-C at yahoo.com. But I'm thinking hors d'oeuvres could be ordered off the menu. Grapes, cheese, bread, and wine could be on all the tables. So we just sit down and then people in the number of the book order, let's say that the books that are being signed and given away that day are books number 26 through 125, well, we just say, uh, you know, books number 26 through 30, come on over to the signing table, and, and we'd go through it in an orderly fashion. And um, if anybody wants to order a book uh, with that in mind or with that not in mind, the, we have a dedicated email address, shake, devil, hand, book, S-A, I'll, I'll print it, but it's S-H-A-K-E, D-E-V-I-L-H-A-N-D-B-O-O-K at gmail.com. Uh, and I would like to talk to Agent Dice uh, about this. And I also want to talk to uh, Agent 66 at some point, either on the phone or... Uh, and also, Ginger Cookie, I see you want book number 77 to match your belt buckle. Uh, let me just say this, that if anybody has a belt buckle and they order a book, it is our intention that we match your belt, your book to your belt buckle. I think at some point, and I've been told by other people, not, not by insiders of Able Danger, but people of collectibles, that uh, perhaps the belt buckles will be collectible someday. And Which reminds me, I've got, <laughs> this is really funny, I've got belt buckle number one and book number one. Belt buckle number one is going to veteran guest at the Texas ranch. We don't know who that'll be. It's like the, the belt buckle of the unknown veteran. And book number one is going to Dr. David Sabo, uh, who's worked tirelessly for the last 25 years to just get the United States government to admit that his brother was murdered, that he didn't commit suicide. And, uh, I think the government may as well go ahead and start processing that change of uh, death certificate because I've got 26 more books queued up. Uh, queued. K-U-E. Well, David, how do you spell queued? K-U-E-U-E-D? I'm not sure. sure. Yeah, David, over to you while I, uh, <clears throat> while I plan this cheese and thing party. Over to okay, you. well, I'll make a prediction, Field, that okay. you're going to need a second and third edition because there's going to be a huge demand for this book, and it's going to uh, explode the demand, pun intended. Well, I, I hope so. Uh, I'll, I'll be really honest with you. I First of all, I think I saw somebody say page number 49. I should read that, and this is... Um, I, you can see clearly that I'm on page 49. This is how we increase the interest in the book. I, this somebody, and somebody you can check the chat log to see who the somebody was. They ask about page 49, and then Ginger just asked about 77. So in both cases, I'll start on page 49 and read till I hit a fact. And what I'm doing is I'm showing you how little fiction there is. Um, my last assignment was Porton Down, where I worked closely with Canadian soldiers who I suspect were working against the interest of the U.S. military. To me, it seemed that the French and Canadians, and worst of all, the French Canadians, 
intended uh, to weaken the U.S. military, and I was aware in 1968 of some chemical warfare issues being studied at Portland Down. As, I wonder if I just, nope, I didn't misspeak. Uh, Portland Down as well as on Plum Island, New York. What I have witnessed has caused me to be concerned with the welfare of the global commoner, commoners, and in my current assignment as deep, at Deep Cut, there is an RAF fellow on our joint staff who shares my concerns, and he is an Avro Vulcan pilot who knows of some CBE issues in some of the conventional ordnance that can be dropped on opposing forces. Okay, there's facts in there. Oh, here's a picture of the USS Guadalcanal, LPA-7. I was on that when I, uh, according to fiction, when I met Agent Dice. Uh, she was four years old. Um, by the way, that is fiction. Okay, I'm looking for 77, I think was Ginger's number. Now, keep in mind, I'm going to go to the upper left corner of 77, and there's a page of the world's most kick-ass F4 Phantom right there. And uh, I'm going to check to make sure I'm right. Yes, I'm right. This is, in fact, the same F-4 that's at Canton, Texas, on a pole. And it's, uh, this F-4 can be found either by its military number, 640965, which is Agent Dice's birthday. Um, in other words, she was born on the 4th of September of 1965. And this, this airplane, this number... Uh, 40965. The civilian registration of this airplane, the Brits operated it uh, contrary to the best interest of the United States of America. The Brits operated the same aircraft as November 424 Foxtrot Sierra F Fs. That can be determined by going to FAA.gov and putting in where it has the November, just put in 424FS. Okay, I'm going to start where Ginger told me to start. A quick response force of four able danger professionals responded to the flash blindness grenades with a much more powerful show of force, dare I say potency. Whoever had tried to disrupt the meeting at Goff's Manor House was now trapped inside a ring of fire that was encircling the restaurant as 36 100-gallon drums of napalm had been triggered by Agent Tillman when he left the restaurant to pursue the lightweights, trying to distract the 13-member package briefing with age, uh, Lady M. Agent McDime had suggested Lady M give a short briefing on what the BBC was currently working on that might have a relationship to the recent murder of Colonel James E. Sabau, USMC, as ordered by G.H.W. Bush, Jeb Bush, Gay Commandant Gray, Assistant Commandant Davis, Brigadier General Wayne T. Adams and Colonel Porky Underwood, as she alluded to a pair of F-4Ds being used at, by BAE and Tracourt at Mojave, tails 965 and 973 from Fargo and Fresno, respectively, all hell had broken loose. Yeah, well, all hell is going to break loose because people in the Bush and Clinton crime families, they're not smart enough to know what I just said, but this is more than a mouthful. And uh, I, I almost have the Stockholm Syndrome. I almost feel sorry for our enemies because they are so inept. David, over to you. Uh, yeah, Field, um, and I'm just intrigued that you mentioned about how much napalm did you talk about? Was that 100 gallons, did you say? Well, there were, like, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to shoot from the hip. You know me, it's ready, fire, aim. Uh, I'm looking it up right now. Do, 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 do. Oh, wait a minute. That was back on. I can't remember. I'm going to go back to page 49. I think that's where that was. Uh, do, 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 do. Nope. I'm wrong. Uh, must have been 77. Uh, I think there were 36 100 gallon uh, deals of napalm that uh, Agent Tillman. Ignited. Yeah, here it is. It's on page 77. Whoever had tried to disrupt the meeting at Goff's Manor House was now trapped inside a ring of fire that was encircling the restaurant as 36 100-gallon drums of napalm had been triggered by Agent Tillman. Okay, and uh, why are you intrigued by that, David? 
Well, because it's consistent with the, the, the philosophy of the hotspot bomb, um, where you can engage in the technology of what's known as improvised explosive devices. And I guess I improvised when I wanted to make that hole in the concrete ramp on Barrow Island because I took an explosive device actually intended for something else and improvised in probably quite a dangerous way uh, for the purpose of making the hole. But there's a very interesting improvisation called the coal bomb. Why don't you just quickly touch on that, Phil, before we wrap up? Well, wasn't the guy's name Courtney? Is that right? Correct. Ah, good. Okay. And the name of the ship, I've forgotten, but uh, it'll probably come to me. The biggest maritime loss of life in the history of the United States of America to this day uh, was when a certain stern wheeler paddle boat was going up the Mississippi with a whole lot of uh, veterans, uh, Union soldiers who'd been captured, and they were in Andersonville Prison in Georgia, where I was in 2011 or maybe 2012. Uh, and when they were, and most of the prisoners there died, it was absolute squalid, um, sort of like the White House is today. But uh, the prisoners of the Confederates uh, had terrible conditions. They were drinking uh, unclean water. And if they hadn't been through enough at the prison camp of Andersonville, Georgia, then they, uh, I think they marched over land. They might have ridden on trains till they got to the river. And uh, then they got on a stern wheeler, and if somebody knows the name of that stern wheeler, it's something Savannah? Like, yeah, Savannah. I was thinking Sequoia, so I had the else right, and I had the rest of it all wrong. Uh, but what they did is they they had a Courtney, Courtney coal bomb, which was an explosive that looked exactly like coal. So when they put it in the coal bins of the stern wheeler, and the firemen would shovel the uh, coal into the boilers uh, to create the steam, they ended up blowing the uh, floor, the keel. Uh, most of you think of the floor of the boat, it's actually the keel of the ship, but let's not get chicken shit here. Um, it just it blew the floor open and then uh, all those people that had survived atrocities as prisoners uh, died and that's the biggest uh, maritime loss in history of the United States of America until this day. And if I misspoke, would somebody please correct me immediately? David, over to you. Yeah, so we need to remember, and that's what's going to be so interesting as we pursue the hot bomb history, what uh, I think his name was Thomas Courtney did with his invention. He went off somewhere, in fact, to the United Kingdom, and tried to persuade the Admiralty to adopt his bomb and protect it with a patent. Now, we don't know what the Admiralty did, Phil, but my guess is they did adopt it. Now, whether they adopted it with a patent protection, I don't know. But given that the Admiralty, or at least the United Kingdom government, supplied, I think, 50,000 Lee Enfield rifles to both sides each year for the first years of the Civil War, uh, you can attribute a very significant proportion of the death and destruction of the American Civil War to the British now. It comes back to who in the United Kingdom government was behind that conspiracy, because it was a conspiracy uh, just like perhaps uh, tossing the tea in Boston Harbor to break away from the crown. Um, my guess is it's the members of the UK uh, cabinet office, which meets with the prime minister of the day, and then, of course, we have to remember that I think between 1750 and 1850, every prime minister of the United Kingdom was a member of the gambling society at White's Club and engaged, presumably, in death betting. So I think we'll find that the Admiralty in the United Kingdom did patent the coal bomb and has been continuing to patent American inventions ever since, including the defense spread switch network using the onion router and Hillary Clinton's QRS-11 gyro chip, which is a core element of the uh, Boeing Honeywell uninterruptible autopilot. And essentially, the precision of the 911 attack 
can be directly attributed to the monopoly uh, control of the United States Patent and Trademark Office through various corrupt patent lawyers led by Hillary Clinton. Over to you, Phil. Uh, you just said something that caught my attention. I can't remember what it was, but uh, I, I just asked for any volunteer planners for the Vino in the Valley book signing, please send ideas to both my private email, Field McCann. Oh, it's not private. Everyone in the world knows that one. F-I-E-L-D-M-C-C at yahoo.com and shakedevilhandbook at gmail.com. I am thinking cheese, wine, grapes, bread, and cheesecake. However, I will defer to the ladies on the thinking of this event. Uh, not just the ladies in our circle of uh, friends, but also the two ladies that uh, are sort of the real boss, the de facto bosses out there at Vino in the Valley. Uh, let's see how fast somebody can put up the YouTube Vino in the Valley, where you see me driving a black presidential limousine with Phil Roberts in the back. And as soon as that comes up, I will play it. And I hope it doesn't kick us off. But I found out last time I played something at the end of a show that even if it kicks us off, live stream is now capable of posting the completed tape. So, David, I'm ready when you're ready. And I just want to make sure everybody understands. I'm not assuming that we're going to sell 10,000 books. Uh, I can guarantee I will not make a penny profit because uh, I don't. It, by the way, let's just be brutally honest. These books are being sold for $20. It says so right in the back of the book. Uh, right there. Let's see what it says. It says uh, $20 US. The ISBN is uh, 13978057818076 And it's got a scanning barcode. The reason they give you this is they probably want to know if you're making any money. Well, I'm not going to make any money. Because uh, between the book costing, in fact, I have to really a nickel dime that it cost about fourteen sixty four to create each book. This book has two hundred eighty four pages, I think, and I'm going to correct myself. Two hundred eighty three pages. Oh, you guys probably will like that last page. Um, there's seventy seven color pages, and. Uh, Somebody might like that page. This book, I, I would say if I had to summarize what this book is, I would say that this book is the first of 27 books where God will laugh at evil people. David, over to you. Yeah, I think you're right, Phil. And um, I just popped up a little uh, paragraph about the Lee Enfield. I think it wasn't the Lee Enfield. It was the Enfield Patton 1853 Rifle Musket. Uh, that was a core element used in by the British Empire from 1853 to 1867. And those were the rifles that were supplied to both sides of the American Civil War to get them, uh, get them started, so to speak, before they started designing their own. So 1223, covered a lot of ground field. I think it's very interesting. I think you're going to sell a lot more books than you can anticipate. And um, uh, may the force be with you. Oh, the force is with us. But wait a minute, David. Uh, before you leave, I'm going to ask you just to stay on. I remember because I'm going to read your name. It's in acknowledgments. It's right here, and I'll tell you the page numbers. Page 11. Acknowledgments. There are numerous individuals without whom this book and this series would not be possible. None of them seek credit, so their real names will not be used. However, without the support of Agents Hawk, Barry M. Hall, and Tillman, this book would never have been written. If not for the encouragement of my fiance Denise, it would never have been considered. Having said that, if the perpetrators of these heinous crimes had not violated their oaths and killed innocent servants honoring their oaths, this truthful revelation would not be necessary and the fictional characters would not need to discover and expose. Further, if it were not for God himself calling me to this service, I dare not write. His call, Psalm 94, 16. His mission, Ephesians 5, 11. His intel, Daniel 2, 21 and 22, and Jeremiah 33, 3. His protection, Psalm 91, 11 to 14, and Isaiah 54, 17. And his ordained result, 
Proverbs 21, 31. And for those of you who've forgotten Proverbs 21, 31, the horse is made ready for the day of battle, but victory rests on the Lord. David, are you about ready to leave now? Uh, yes, I am, Field. And um, in fact, for future reference, uh, you, I don't mind at all if you use my full name. I'm proud of it, actually. Well, I use my full name all over this thing. And uh, this is... This is where the name, the front of the book, and I think, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna divert. I've never been to a book signing. I bet you Ginger Cookie and Mensa Max have been, uh, but I think, and it doesn't matter. I mean, they can tell me whatever they want. I'll probably do whatever they say, but I'm not committing to that now. I'm just saying that uh, when we sign these books, uh, wherever two or three may gather in Gadget Bent's name, uh, whoever is a named agent. Uh, and let me just go through the chat room right now. Any, any of these agents that are at a book signing, they will be asked to sign the book if they'd be willing to, even using their real name or their agent name. And here's named agents. Afterburner, Agent 66, uh, Hawk, Declan, Dice, McDime, Chips, Uh, I'm skipping over some, but I shouldn't be doing that, so I'll back up and try not to skip. Uh, Music Czar, Ginger Cookie, Hammer McCheese, Father Mulcahy, uh, do, 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 Agent Data. I'm having to skip a couple here. Cause there's Anyway, uh, Agent Autopilot from Norway. Welcome aboard. Uh, do -do 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 I think I've... Oh no, a vanishing point. Almost missed him. Um, any of those people, in fact, come to think of it, if anybody that's even in the chat room has ever, that would be Bent Wrench, Dave Deed, and the others that I... Who knows who's going to end up with these uh, book signings, like Spit and Kitten. Uh, he's saying he's going to come to the plunge. Uh, whoever is a participant in the Able Danger Force, uh, we can all sign the book. And I think the reason that's better, uh, I think just from my own standards and my own feelings, if I sign the book by myself, I think I'd be arrogant, as arrogant as chips. David, over to you, and let's ask for the big red button from Mensa. And then nobody gave me that Vino in the Valley video yet, but if it shows up, I'll play that after David leaves. Okay, thanks, Field. <clears throat> and, um, yeah, like I said, the force be with you. It's good progress, and um, I'm really looking forward to hearing your, your news when, you, uh, when you're in the UK. Over to you. Okay, and what belt buckle number are you? I'm seven. Okay, then you'll be book 007. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I'd love that. Okay, let's have a race to see who can get rid of you first, me or you. On the count of ten, one... Two, three, four. I hope he wasn't waiting for 10. Okay, let's see. There's, oh, 